you can fly away. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no one flies away for another, well, 30, 35 minutes. How's that? 35 minutes because there's a song after this that I'm not going to sing. You're going to sing. 200-year celebration. There's not many churches that, that celebrate something, and certainly pastors. Not many pastors have the opportunity to pastor a church that is uh, celebrating 200th year, and let alone be able to preach to a congregation uh, on a 200th celebration. So I uh, count as a very unique honor and a privilege. We've been preparing for this for a very long time. Actually, two years ago, we began mentioning uh, the 200th year celebration, and people were like, that's, that's a long ways away. Well, it's here. And there's been a lot of work that's gone into uh, preparing for this day. Several months, and certainly the last several weeks, have been ramped up into uh, what you see here today. And so we thank all those people that have been uh, so actively involved with this process. But as we have been bringing messages to you as a pastor over the past several weeks now, we've been gearing up for this special time. We've been talking about the church. Is it important? Is it really even significant? Or is it just something to pass the time away on a Sunday morning? I hope that you have been challenged by the significance of the church over the past several weeks. I hope you've been challenged as a believer in Jesus Christ to be pursuing Christ to have purpose, to have meaning when we congregate here together. It really does make all the difference in the world. Today, as we think about today's message, just finalizing this, this last message in this series on the church, whether you find your allegiance to this body of believers or to another one around this country, this message is for you. It is a significant message because we live in a world today that is much different as some of the, the pastors and missionaries have already mentioned. We don't do things exactly the same way as we did back 200 years ago. We don't preach exactly the same way. We don't sing exactly the same way. But yes, the message is still the same solid, rock-founded message that it's always been for the last, not 200 years, but 2,000 years. And it will never change until Jesus Christ says, that's it. And it could be today yet. And so whether you're, wherever you find yourself holding your allegiance to, as far as a local body of believers, you need to understand that these are perilous times, uncertain times, difficult times. And so I'm going to challenge you, just on a couple different levels, as uh, we've been challenged already. But yet, I also want to, want to leave you with a great hope that we have. First of all, I want to begin with what we need to be about doing. What we've always been about doing, but we need to really grasp this concept in a greater way. We as a local body of believers, and certainly the universal church, Needs it not needs, it must be about proclaiming God's Word. It has to be. If it doesn't, if it seeks to back off, if it seeks to lighten the message, then we are just giving great disservice not only to ourselves, but also to the world around us. We need to understand that this is a very serious matter. And quite frankly, if you would travel around this country, you will notice, you will notice that there is becoming a famine in our land. There was once a day when you would drive down the road and you would come into towns like this and you would identify churches and oftentimes they would look like this building with a steeple on it and it would have a title on the front and you would say, you would confidently say, I know that the Word of God is being preached there today, on this Sunday morning, and it would kind of make you feel good, that great, that, that group of people are about preaching God's Word, not only for themselves, but also as a light to the community in which that church would be setting in. 
And we would confidently go through the communities and, and be able to identify such places. But yet, as we look at the world in which we live, it's not so. We live in a postmodern culture in which there is a tremendous amount of pressure upon the pastor, upon the people that would stand as a leader in a, in a group setting such as this, to reflect that postmodern culture. We have a strong need, an urgent need, for men that stands in front of you as their pastor. This, this church, other churches, to give to you, to proclaim, proclaim boldly the pure, unwatered down Word of God. It must be about that. You must have a strong, strong presence of someone that would dare to stand in front of you, whatever generation, and proclaim the Word of God. It doesn't happen in a lot of churches, even churches that would call themselves Baptist. You today, on the man of God that would stand in front of congregations like this, there are threats upon his life. Unless you stand in his shoes, you need to understand that. There are threats to him financially, support, participation, the undercurrent that continues to flow underneath the very foundation of the church. Snide comments, defamation of character, and yes, even coming soon to a pastor near you, fines and imprisonment. You think we snicker at that, but they're coming. Believe me, when a man of God will stand in front of, a, of and take a firm stance upon things that are really anti-culture, there will be fines imprisonment coming. We need to understand as a group of people that the heart of man must constantly hear the Word of God, hear the voice of God and His message. Not be clouded over by the culture or by voices around them that are bearing down. You don't need another person to stand in front of you and to give you another view of the way I view this country. <laughs> You can, there are a dime a dozen on the radio, on television, and they'll be more than glad to give you their opinion and what they think. But we need someone that stands in front of people giving the unadulterated Word of God. There's a famine in our land, and we must recognize that. Israel served as a great demonstration for the waywardness of people's hearts. Your heart, my heart. I want to just show to you just some different time frames in which Israel very much looked like the country that we are living in and certainly beginning to get even worse in that area. I want to show to you Ezekiel. He lived in some difficult times, some parallel, perilous times, in which the Word of God was really rather thin in, in his audience that he was called to preached to was rather a, a calloused audience. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Ezekiel chapter 2. And if you have a chair Bible in front of you, it's on page 693. And if you're in the real cheap seats back there, we probably don't have a Bible back there. But you're just going to have to pay extra close attention. Or I can walk back there to you and read right to you. No, nah, I won't do that today. That's a little bit of a joke, just to lighten things up a little bit. A calloused audience... This man, Ezekiel, had a, had a very important role, and God was going, and God is speaking to him here in this second chapter of the book of Ezekiel. And let me just read to you the first seven verses. And he, God, said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send to you the people of Israel to the nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, they are a rebellious house. They will, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns 
are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, they are a rebellious house. And so as we see this audience that, that Ezekiel is given, it very much resembles a number of, of people in our world today, in the context of our nation. It's people that look on to people that proclaim the Word of God. They look and they hear things being said, but they have a sneering. If they don't, you don't see it externally, certainly in their heart, it's a sneering type heart. It's a hardened people. And it's people that have a, have a attitude whether they really care not to, to serve the Lord or to hear from Him and not even to obey Him. And so why would they even have a heart that is even wanting to obey or hear the Word of God? Flip over just several more chapters to Ezekiel chapter 33. And it's getting very close to our time today. Verse 31 through 32. 30, chapter 33, verse 31 and 32. And they come to you as a people come. And they sit before you as my people. And they hear what you say. But they will not do it, for with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument, for they hear what you say, but they will not do it. And I fear this is a growing, a growing thing that is happening in our land and in our churches. There are people that come, even though the audience even is getting smaller in our churches. They come, they come for some unknown reason. And they come and they hear the words, but they won't do it. They hear the words because they, they, they want to hear them. They have a, a melodious sound to them. It, it's almost like it's, it's something that's embedded in their upbringing. I got to come to church and I got to hear that guy rattle on for 30 minutes. And, and then I, I sit there and I, I kind of I hear what he's saying and it kind of has a melodious sound to it. But at, that's all the further that the word of God goes. It doesn't penetrate into their heart. And they certainly don't have the ambition to change or will to change. The preacher must do very well, very, very, very well at preparing all that he can to transfer that message of God to the culture, to the community in which God has given to them. Urging them, pleading them to heed God's Word. And that's what a pastor is about doing when he stands before you and he preaches. And he must be about that on constantly not letting up. Our hearts need that. Because we are, by nature, a wayward people. We need to prepare and be ready to receive the Word of God. If I were to show you a picture such as this, what are these men prepared to do? Jump! Thank you. I knew you wouldn't be bashful. These men are, I can't think of more of any type of situation that a person needs to be prepared for than a parachuter. Right? Well, I, I, I was trying to think of something, but I'm sure there's something else out there. But parachuters got to be right at the top. These men are ready to jump. They're, they're prepared. They've got everything ready, and they're, they're just ready for the door to open up, and they're, they are gone. Preparedness is something that's vital for the believer. When we come together, do you prepare your heart? Or do you come to say, I wonder what they got in store for me this week. I wonder what songs we're going to sing. And I wonder if I'm going to like it. <laughs> I wonder if Pastor Rodney is going to stumble over words. I wonder how many times I'm going to count those this week. <laughs> I brought extra paper. <laughs> but, I come, but I come for who knows. But, but we need to come, folks. Whether it's you and whether it's me, we need, to be, we need to prepare ourselves and ready to receive the Word of God. In a very special way. Not just hearing the words. We need to be ready. Expectant audience. 
We need to be a people that is prepared to hear God's Word and ready to do business with God. It doesn't do much good for you just to hear the words and for me to just go on and talking and talking and talking unless those words aren't allowed to penetrate into the very fertile ground of a heart. It's your responsibility, my responsibility, to cultivate my heart to receive the Word of God and allow it to grow and to flourish. We must be about that as a church. But also, there's another time factor in which I want to point out to you during the Old Testament in which Amos found himself in a unique position. All prophets find themselves in a unique position. But Amos, a good old country boy, and of course that strikes a a chord with me right off the bat. And here he is, he's just a simple guy, and he's given a very simple message during very difficult times. And listen to, to what he is saying. I better flip there myself. Amos. That's why I put these little tabs in my Bible so that I don't get distracted by what I'm doing right now. Chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. The Word of God says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. That was a famine far greater than any food or or any water. This was a famine of the word of God in which the heart was longing to hear something from their Creator. Something! And they looked all over. They couldn't find the word of God. And yet we live in a country where it's becoming more like that. Watered down truths. Un- excuse me, compromised words. We live in a, in a world where we are starving ourselves. We're looking for the Word of God. Our hearts really want the, the unadulterated truth of the Word of God. The pure, whole Word of God. But yet we are starving ourselves with messages that are watered down. Truth that is virtually non-existent. It's an emptiness across our land. But also, one more prophet I want to bring to your attention. The prophet, the prophet Joel. And all you have to do is turn back a couple more pages to the left, and you're going to find this great prophet, Joel. He lived in a time when there was an actual famine when there was, there was no food, there was difficulty in finding something to eat for the rest of the day, there was a difficult circumstance in which Joel and the country found themselves in. And God used this time in order to chasten the people back to Himself. Look at what it says here in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with your your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast lover, lover, and love. (laughs) See? See how I do it? And He relents over disaster. And so, here is Joel living in this land. It's it, the, the ground, I, I'd never been part of a, of a place where there's famine on the land, but if you go out west and, and they tell me that uh, when there's like a blight of locusts or grasshoppers that are coming across the field, and you can literally watch that being devastated, green on this side and on this side totally devastated, all the green totally gone. In Joel's time, that's exactly what happened. And God allowed that army, in which, which the Word of God calls it, my army, which I sent among you, those locusts, those grasshoppers, that God sent into the land in order for the people of God to be chastened back to the Word of God. And so Joel lived during this time in which desolation of famine wreaked havoc on the land. And yet, even through this time, that God said, 
even though your hearts are wayward away from me, even in your waywardness, return to me and I will restore you. Not only would he restore the land and put food back in on their shelf, in their kitchens, in their pantries, but God would do something far greater. He would restore the heart. Isn't that really what we're after? And we go through the pages of Scripture and we can see that time and time again of the waywardness of people. Either it's back in Genesis all the way through Revelation. There is a waywardness that we have. Something about our nature that wants to turn away from God. And we must fight against that. Fight with all that we have in order to to pursue after God. To have a heart that's really chasing hard after Him. But even through this waywardness, it's not the outwardness that God wants. It's the inwardness that God is looking for. We can come every single week to these doors, and we won't have a right relationship with our Lord. I don't know how many times I've run into people out in the community. People I haven't seen in a long time. People that just kind of stepped off the edge of the earth. And the pastor, I'm glad to see you. I've got to get back to church. You've heard that line probably a million, two million times. As if that some magic formula of coming into the doors is going to change them. Well, it could be a step in that right direction. But that's not what God's looking for. You know your heart is wayward. Get on your knees and repent. And repent right now. God wants your heart. He doesn't want your service. He wants your heart. And then the service will come. So we need to understand how this all takes place. In other words, God says, don't give me your works without your heart. Don't go through these motions. Don't just show up. Don't just do your thing on Sunday morning. Don't just go through all of these rituals that you have. But give me your heart. Church, you must give me your heart. Because I don't want your service if your heart's not there. And so we need to understand that when this happens, it's only then through genuine repentance of our waywardness that His grace will shower down on us and restore us. As we think about an application this morning, 200 years, 200 years, and and for some of you that are just visiting here, you haven't had the the pleasure of hearing all of these messages leading up to this point, and I'm sorry for that. But for you, especially, Panama Baptist Church, how do we move forward? How do we go on from here? We must. We must be people that are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Is that your goal when you come here to unite corporately? Is that your goal when you wake up in the morning? Do you really hunger after God? Do you even know what that means? When you wake up in the morning, you say, I need to meet with God. I can't begin my day unless I sit down and have an intimate time with Him. A time when I can hear from Him and He will speak to my open heart, ready to receive His Word and more importantly, ready to do it. Is that really the appetite that you have? We must be about that. We must make our hearts ready to receive the Word of God. And more importantly, we must be ready to do the Word of God. Turn to the Lord with your whole heart. But then I think, individually, that's the way we must be, and corporately too. But I think in a corporate way, as a church, how do we move forward? How do we do this? We must understand, and we must not lose focus. And I would say every pastor, going back to pastor, the first pastor, Simmons. Simmons? Simmons? Simeon Powers. Powers, that's it. I knew I'd get those names mixed up. It's a charm that I have that that people really come to appreciate. You have to have a flavor for it. (laughs) Pastor Powers, can we just call him that? All the way to Pastor Sprouse, Pastor Bump. We need to be about making sure that this is a house of worship. 
Don't lose the focus. And it's not what happens here on Sunday morning at, for one hour. This focus, this ambition, this pursuit is something, it's a lifelong pursuit. It's, a, it's something that needs to go on. It was happening here yesterday. We were out mowing, planting flowers, and they were vacuuming these chairs, and I hope you appreciate that. There's like 20 hours of vacuuming chairs. You guys need to start wearing hair nuts before you come into the auditorium because it really, we put a lot of hair on a, not some of us guys don't have to worry about that, but uh, yeah, like Dan. But, uh, but anyway, you need to quit putting fingernail clippings though on the chairs, so you've got to stop doing that. Pay attention. But this must be a house of worship. It must be. A place where Christ is exalted and magnified in pursuit. If we do nothing else, and really, that really should be the else. That should be everything that we do. Exalting Him and magnifying Him and pursuing Him. If we're not doing that, then we're probably doing something we shouldn't be doing. We also need to understand that this place must be a place where people that are abused can come. This should be a place where people are hurting can come and say, I know that I can come to that place and I won't be judged based upon my being, but they will help me to find peace and rest through my difficulties, through my problems. It should be a place of broken people. It should be a refuge for those who are hurting and suffering, addicted, and struggling. We shouldn't be judging them coming into the door, but we should be surrounding them with God's love and saying, listen, I don't know what you're going through, but I want to hold you up. I want to help you. I want to point you to the one, the only one that can provide help, that can provide peace to your life. It should be a place in which people that are dealing with death And divorce can come and find understanding. If you've ever been involved with any of that, you know that the question of why surrounds your life. You can't even think beyond the next next thought because you just don't understand it. If it's not death, if it's not divorce, if it's not hurting, if it's not suffering or addiction or struggling or abuse, it's just sheer pressure of our society that that continues to bear down on the one that's trying to live for Christ. And this ought to be a place where refuge, a house of refuge, a place where you can find understanding to what the big picture is. I think of the psalmist when he says, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I discern their end. That's a big picture. We ought to be able to come to the church And be able to realize, yeah, you know what? I am hurting. I am suffering. I'm dealing with difficult things. But I know that there is an answer there that I can find. And I can find people that will help me, encourage me, and move me on in that direction. We must not lose focus on that. As a church, we must understand that we are salt and light to this community. God has given this church... Right here in Panama, New York, the responsibility to be salt and light. The church is the only beacon of light that they have. You, individually, did you know that? If it's not for you, they have no hope. Sure, they can go watch Dr. Phil on television or Oprah, and they're going to find out, they're going to get a lot of opinions. But they're not going to get the hope, the only hope. And how are they going to get that hope? The only hope that they they can get is through us. And it's only when that beacon in ourselves, when we turn to the Lord with our whole heart, that we can be that light that we need to be to this community. I appreciate your challenge to being... uh, We need to be reaching out to others, not just in our little four walls. And we have been making strides in that direction to reach into the community, showing them the love of Christ, and just meeting them where they are, and meeting their needs, and just showing them and demonstrating to them that we are loving, caring people, not in and of ourselves. It's because there is something significant that happened within our hearts. It's called Christ meant us. 
He changed our heart. He transformed us. And He can transform your life. And they come against difficult, perilous times. And they will. And they will search for hope. They will look for hope. And they will find that beacon. They will say, Panama Baptist Church, that is a caring group of people. Look at the way that they came and handed out backpacks in our community. Look at the way that they showed loving kindness in, in different ways of the stock, helping to stock the food pantry, helping, helping to put gas in their car as they travel through and they run out of money. That is a place that is transformed. They are truly the beacon. They are truly the light on the hill in which I must draw myself to because then, only then, can I find true hope for my life. Amen. Folks, this is serious business. This is, we can sure have fun. We can sure enjoy ourselves living, being, being believers in Jesus Christ, but we have a matter here that we must be diligently doing. I've been talking about the Ephesian church in the last several weeks. And I'd like to just close with you the challenge, the admonition that Paul gives to this church. And he says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You so much once again for this opportunity to be together as a body of believers. Lord, it's because of You that we assemble together. We assemble because we love You. We want to exalt Your name. We want to pursue You individually and corporately. And God, I pray if there's someone here that doesn't know what that means, that today, Father, that You would work in their heart. If they don't have that relationship with You, if they never repented and turned to You by faith, oh God, I pray by the, the hound dog of heaven, named the Holy Spirit, would not let them go, would continue to put the heavy weight of conviction upon their heart. And today they would come and repent and turn to You. Oh God, these are desperate times and it calls for desperate measures. And Christ is that answer. And we pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen.